Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest eRome webinar. <clears throat> Back on the plane, what will travel look like post COVID? Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday morning. Uh, before we start, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. We'll probably take about 30, 35, 40 minutes uh, to go through our talk. And at the end, we'll have a QA session. If you've got any questions uh, during the talk, there is a QA button on your uh, Zoom interface uh, at the bottom. So if you click on that, you can type your question in there and then we'll answer it. Either we'll wait to the end or we'll answer it at a suitable uh, a suitable juncture during the talk. Um, right, so again, thanks for uh, joining this latest webinar. And today we're gonna be talking about what we think travel is gonna look like uh, post COVID-19. Um, just to introduce our two presenters today, I'm Tim Russell. I'm a Eurome's Commercial Director for Southeast Asia, and I also look after the company's digital marketing. And with me, as you can see in the picture, is our CEO and co-founder, Anthony Hill. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. Hello to everyone in Asia. Well, good afternoon, Anthony, because you're in Melbourne, aren't you? So Yes, correct. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, I believe, where you are. And a lovely sunny day at that. Yes, a lovely hot sunny day here in Bangkok today as well. A little, little bit too hot, actually. Right, let's get started. Let's quickly just run through what we're going to be talking about this morning, the agenda. Uh, we're going to be starting off by looking at the numbers about how COVID-19 has, has affected the travel industry. Uh, you probably all, we, we don't really need to go into great detail on, detail on that. You all know that the travel industry is, uh, is in a pretty bad way at the moment. Then we'll look at traveller sentiment. What travelers are saying when we think a recovery is likely there's been some good news this week so we'll be we'll be looking at that uh we'll look at some what we think likely trends are going to be in travel post covid19 and how travel companies can capitalize on those and then we'll finish off uh with a q a session as i said before but first of all let's have a look at the uh the numbers uh here's um prediction from the unwto um, the pandemic could set tourism sector back by almost as much as a trillion. Um, tourism revenues 2019 were about 1.5 trillion. That looks like it could be as low as 310 billion this year, depending on the opening of borders and the lifting of travel restrictions. So uh, huge losses for the travel industry uh, worldwide. And I think we are possibly going to see the worst case scenario there with um, Travel restrictions probably not lifting until December and beyond. In a little look at what's happened here in here in Thailand up until June this year. This is year on year change in international tourism arrivals, and as you can see, April, May, and June. And again, it'll be the same for the rest of the year up to up to date, um, minus 100%. So there have been no international tourist arrivals in Thailand. I think we had one Chinese tour group arrive a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that's really been uh, about it. So it's been a, a disastrous year for, for a country that's particularly reliant on travel and tourism. And uh, estimated job losses in the tourism industry this year. Um, estimated that around 100 million jobs in tourism and associated industries, industries that supply the tourism industry or depend on the tourism industry, which is about a third of the total workforce, with the vast majority of that 63.4 million coming uh, here in uh, Asia Pacific. So again, a lot of people out of work, we're seeing a lot of businesses closing down, we've seen a lot of big, even a lot of big tour companies, big DMCs uh, in Asia closing down as well. So that all sounds very depressing, where are some good numbers? Well, with, let's yeah, let's have some good numbers. Let's let's not just talk about the bad. You all know the bad news, um, but it's not all it's not all bad. Now we um, I've included this slide. This is Tui, the world's biggest travel company. This is what's happened to their share price this year. As you can see, um, from a start of a thousand, it plummeted right down to just over two hundred. Um, but we can see in the last the last few weeks, we can see a little upward curve in the last month. And if we go into the next slide, this is what's happened to Tui share price um, in the last month. So it's gone from 300 up to 540. So that's uh, that's a big increase. So that's a, that's a good sign, isn't it, Anthony? Yeah, well, and, and this seems to be the trend that we're seeing here, especially in Australia. 
when you look at chairs of so Webjet, Qantas, Hello World, um, they're all doing similar things. As they, they start to see light at the end of the tunnel, um, as our borders in Australia are starting to open up, you are starting to see um, the investment um, and, and, and the share prices going up in, in, in the travel sector. So that's really good because that means that the, um, the, the senior management in these uh, companies uh, are starting to realise that there is light at the end of the tunnel um, and they're starting to plan for it. Um, we're still not seeing a lot um, of people walking into the travel agencies at the moment, but there is that, 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 that feeling that we're right on the verge of it. Um, and yeah, that is showing in shares. So that's a great indicator for us. And good news about vaccine this week as well, of course. Fair, yes, absolutely. That's my, that's my, that, that's what started the spike was when, when they, uh, when Pfizer said, you know, we've got a, a 94 or 96% um success rate in their in yeah. their vaccination so so let's look at look at more positive news and a bit of traveler sentiment um this is a survey from uh, oag and uh, they surveyed travelers worldwide when they plan to fly again and globally 69 percent of travelers uh, are planning to fly internationally if they can in the next six months and the figures domestic are even higher um in the in north america it's as high as 73 percent um, so again, that's that's another positive sign. There's a lot of pent up travel demand out there, isn't there, Anthony? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was trying to book a hotel earlier today, um, and the price was fifty percent higher than what it was pre-COVID. Um, and bookings hard hard to make in domestically here in Australia. So yeah, it's the same in it's the same in Thailand. I, I went to Kanchanaburi a couple of weeks ago. The hotel was absolutely jam packed. wasn't a spare room. The train there was was packed. So um, yeah, people are really uh, are traveling domestically already. And and that's the way how we are going to reboot in this industry. Yeah, and, and we'll up. we'll look at some and look at some figures on domestic travel in a in a in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, and here's a forecast from uh, McKinsey, um, who say that whilst tourism revenue won't reach 2019 levels until 2023. We're going to see a significant increase next year, 25%, and, and an even bigger increase in, um, in 2022. So um, although we may not be back at 2019 levels for a while, we're going to see 2021 will be a, will be a better year and 2022 will be a much, much, much better year. And, you know, like it was only a couple of months ago, they were saying that that was going to take 10 years to get back on track. So um, it's yeah. good to see um, some more positive reporting here in these numbers. Exactly. exactly. OK, so it's been bad, but as we can see, it's getting better. So let's have a look at what we think some of the, um, the most likely trends are going to be as uh, the industry starts to recover. First one of these we, we mentioned it briefly uh, is domestic tourism. And I think everybody can see in their in their own countries how domestic tourism is improving. Here's a couple more stats from McKinsey. Um, they see that uh, domestic tourism will recover probably one or two years earlier than outbound travel, um, and it's already performing better than than the hotel and airline sectors. And I think you know, we've all, we've all experienced that in our own countries. In Thailand at the moment, weekends, hotels, beaches, flight, domestic flights trains are all packed it's a little bit quieter during the week because there are no international tourists here but certainly domestically people are traveling um, there are a lot of good hotel and travel deals at the moment and people are taking advantage of that they're also taking advantage of the fact that there are no foreign tourists here and places that are normally crammed with foreign tourists are empty so now is actually a good time to visit them and i think the tourism boards around the world are doing a good job um, at promoting that domestic tourism also um, you, you, you've seen the market shift a lot from, you know, what you would have been seeing advertising on TV and in the, in the newspapers 12 months ago to what you're seeing now. It's very much focused on, 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 on that domestic market. Um, and you're also seeing a lot of tour companies, uh, big global tour companies uh, here, here in Australia, where they've never operated before, starting to do tours in Australia so they can keep their brand strong. So people don't forget their, 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 their brand whilst it, um, tourism is, is focused on, on the domestic market. And 
also getting those people that would book that, I don't know, that Globus trip through, through, through Canada at the moment. They go on a Globus trip every year. Globus are now offering trips in Australia. So they can still get that repeat clientele, even though they're doing different things. Exactly, yeah. And here's what's happened in, in China. Obviously, um, this is tourism recovery in China, year on year change from 2019 to 2020. As we can see, there was a massive slump in, in February because China was you know, the, the first place to be hit by the virus. But as we can see now, in terms of hotel bookings, numbers are actually better this year than, than they were in 2019. Subway passengers, domestic flights, railway is all, is all gradually starting to recover. Obviously, international is not recovering yet, but we can see that domestically, uh, China is, uh, is starting to boom again. So again, that's a, that's a positive sign. Um, so how can companies benefit? How can travel companies benefit from this? Anthony, you mentioned it earlier that companies that have traditionally focused on, on international travel uh, are focusing on promoting domestic destinations and promoting to domestic tourists instead. And we're saying that right yeah. across the board, you know. Um, I think we, we saw Intrepid um, release a, a handful of new trips in Australia. G Adventures has done it. Travel corporation brands are doing it. You know, everyone yeah, I met, is. I met with the DMC earlier this week, and they're, they're even they're starting to promote domestic trips to the the Thai market as well. So, something new. For and them. that's something that we actually talked on in in, in an earlier webinar about that uh, shift in and 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 looking at who the market was for for the DMCs. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because because when when things start to reopen. It's not, it may not be your traditional market that reopens. Um, it, you know, it, it, for, for Thailand, Thailand have said that they are going to welcome the Chinese market early. Um, so all of these companies that are so focused on the, on the European market, if they want to get a piece of that pie, they're gonna need to chip their, 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 their product offerings. Yeah, exactly. I think the first tourists to be coming to Thailand is going to be from China, from other Southeast Asian countries like um, Singapore, Vietnam, and so on. So uh, yeah, yeah. And I've, I, I also it was, I saw last week I think that they opened up a bubble between Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, they opened it and then they suspended it, and I think they're reopening it in two weeks because there were a couple they found some more COVID cases in Hong Kong apparently. Okay. So, <laughs> so it was. One step forward, another step back, and then hopefully a step forward again in a couple. But and and this is what I, I think we're going to see over the next six months. We've got a lot yeah. of nervous governments out there um, that are, 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 they they're going to play politics with uh, who they let it in um, and and how they manage this. Uh, and yeah, exactly. Maybe, yeah, until we get this vaccination, that is just going to be the new norm. I think um, you know promoting lesser known or secret domestic destinations to encourage discovery uh, as well. I know again here in Thailand there are a lot of Thais that have never been to certain uh, particular destinations. So I think uh, promoting these lesser known destinations is, is a good way to benefit. Well, where you we went last last week up to Kanchanaburi, you know, it's it's a much nicer getaway from Bangkok than going down to oh, it's um, nicer than Pattaya or somewhere like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think stressing the lack of foreign tourists is uh, a good thing. We we did this uh, we did the same webinar to India yesterday, and apparently now is a very good time to visit the Taj Mahal because there are no there are no tour groups there. Um, same in Cambodia with Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat has never been this quiet, um, so it's a good time to visit these destinations. Um, and of course, embracing technology that gives you access to thousands of domestic suppliers. I think travel agents that are geared up to foreign travel maybe don't have the contacts to do domestic travel and, and in order to be responsive, I think they need to, to jump into technology that gives them access to, to lots of domestic suppliers in one go, in one, in one place, in one marketplace. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that's a big thing that the whole industry has realized. Um, tech companies in general, including ourselves, have never been busier than we are at the moment. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, the travel industry has started to realize how far behind the technology um being used is in, in 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 the industry um and and because people have had the time um we're finding a lot of people embracing technology not only for bookings and mid-office but just for communicating 
like we yeah. are at the moment doing, doing zooms you know this is technology is a friend um and i i think the industry is starting to realize that exactly let's have a look at the the next trend i think there's going to be more of a focus on refunds and cancellations here's an article from the new york times uh, from september i think why is getting a refund from an online travel agency so hard a lot of people have, have had trouble getting refunds for bookings that they made with OTAs uh, during the uh, for travel during the COVID period. And here's a new story from the UK earlier this year. Trust in the travel industry plummets to a record low amid the coronavirus refund scandal. So a lot of people had got trips booked the COVID period, couldn't travel, and are still trying to get their uh, their money back. Obviously, it's a problem for travel companies and airlines who are, who've got problems with liquidity at the moment. They're not getting any money coming in. They've got a lot of refund money to go out. So it's a, it's a big problem here for the industry. And of course, travel agents who are once refund clients have to get the money back from their suppliers as well. So it's- um, And I think, you know, I think that is the big problem. You know, um, the airlines have been so slow in refunding. My sister had five business class flights, $50,000 worth of air with, 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 with with an airline and it took me five months to get the money back from from that air, airline i i had um some bookings work for that took over three months to get the money back and and the problem is is the consumer blames um that the agent if the if the agent is slow but but generally speaking it's the hoteliers that are slow or yeah. the tour operators, or the um, airlines that want to hold on to all of that money and just not cancel the trip, defer it, and 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 that is a real issue. And I I, I think that will be a big change in the industry as we come out of COVID. Um, I think you've got some slides on insurance coming up. Yes, coming um, up here. Um... But besides from insurance. I think that's been a big debate in the industry over the last couple of years on charging fees um, for, for your service. And that's going to become a big play. Um, if, if you help out people, save them hours or weeks by helping them plan a trip, you, you deserve to get paid something, whether that's $50 or, or $100. Oh, sure, yeah. But I think that the big difference will also be that part of that advice will be you telling them which airlines are the good airlines, who will give you the, the refunds, and also advising on the travel insurance um, because insurance is will become a, a big play also. Um, yeah, I think insurance, when borders reopen, a lot of companies are going to insist on travellers having um, insurance that covers COVID-19 as well. Uh, so that's going to become even more important. Here's a this is a recent uh, survey for a recent report from Skiff. Um, and here you can see 33% of people are seeking more insurance coverage for travel than they would have done before uh, COVID 19. So that's that's a huge increase. That's you know, third I of think the also insurances for just cancelling for any reason it, it will become a bigger player in the insurance market post COVID. Yeah. Here's from the same report. How important is COVID-19 and other pandemic travel and related travel insurance coverage to you going forward? 61% say very important and 28% say somewhat important. So that's 89% of people uh, who see travel insurance as, as being important when they start traveling again. Um, so these are big issues. So, so what can companies do to, to, to deal with this issue? Obviously, I think offering clear and, and ambiguous policies when it comes to changing bookings, canceling bookings, getting refund, making sure that you communicate that clearly to the um, to the, the client right at the start of the inquiry process, that it's not buried away in the small print, but it's very, very clear what they're, what they're getting. And make sure refunds are processed, processed quickly. Make sure you're working with suppliers who you know are going to refund you quickly and make sure you, you understand your supplier's refund process as well, that, you cannot, that, that you're going to be able to refund people. And of course, there's a big opportunity for travel companies to sell more insurance as well. As we, as I just mentioned, dedicated COVID coverage is probably going to be a requirement for a lot of countries uh, when issuing visas uh, in the next few months. And it's a great revenue earner. You know, it, it quite, quite often you can earn more money out of selling the insurance than you do out of selling the flight. <laughs> exactly. 
and of course use technology that makes it easy to change bookings to cancel bookings and, uh, and issue and issue the and issue refunds um that can be a bit of a bottleneck in the travel industry that we've seen so, that, so using technology that streamlines that process can can help you deal with it that that is a major challenge um and it's a major challenge because so many suppliers they, they make every excuse not not to do a refund um and in, well no in, no one likes giving out refunds do they <laughs> but you know um in, in the end it costs some money dealing with the complaints dealing with all of the time spent on on managing all of these these, these refunds and inquiries and chasing up um the, the, the clients chasing up the, the funds technology can save all of these operators a lot of money it can yeah. save a lot of stress for the consumers it can make life a lot easier for, for the travel agents there is also, also dealing with this well is actually a good opportunity to win over clients. I mean, if, if, if you deal with a client's cancellation and refund quickly and efficiently and in a good way, if the client has a positive experience with that, then they're more likely to book with you in, in future. Yeah. If you, well, if, you, if you delay it and mess them around for months on end, they're not going to book with you again. Simple as that. We've been, we've been working um, on um, changes, cancellation and refunds for um, 18 months now. So um, we've started on... on, on on this before COVID with, our, with the E-Roam technology. And the biggest challenge has been um, the ability through suppliers technology to automate that. Um, but I, but, but it, it's something that is high on our agenda. Um, we're gonna be releasing phase one of doing changes and cancellations uh, next quarter, uh, which will be a game changer for, for the industry. But it's something that the whole industry needs to put pressure on the suppliers um, to streamline this and, and, and just make it fairer and easier um, and for, 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 for the clients and the agents. Yep. Good. Um, let's move on. The next one kind of related to that is an increasing concern in, in health and safety. This is an Amadeus survey into American traveller sentiment. Um, about how they feel about traveling in the age of COVID-19. 45% have got a fear of mixing with crowds. They want to avoid crowds if possible. 42% are worried about the increased risk of catching or transmitting the virus. And 39% are concerned about safety and cleanliness uh, on public transport. And here is how that translates uh, into the importance of COVID prevention measures when booking. Um, Two thirds of travelers say that COVID-19 prevention measures are important to know before they book. Most importantly in hotels, 66% and flights. So before people travel, before they book, they wanna know up front what, that, what their airline is doing to control COVID-19, what their hotel's doing to control COVID-19. And um, obviously something that people didn't really worry about before, but now it's a big concern. This is, um, you know, this is a new problem um, that has that that we've had to learn about quickly. Um, and yeah, completely new. Before um, January, February, yeah, I, most people had never considered. Um, and one of the companies that were really quick to act on this was J Ride. Um, they're a, 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 an aggregator for for transfers. I, I think they service 1,500 airports around the world uh, and 3,000 tour companies. But they, they back in you know, May, uh, May, June, already had as part of their um, booking process and, and information, um, ratings on each of the companies that they're using um, and, and the processes they do for cleaning the vehicles after, after, after use. And, and standardizing um, the cleanliness and, and COVID-19 um, safety of each of them, their, their vendors. So that was that was something that you know was really forward thinking. Um, and that's something yeah, that's, that, re that's really good. Uh, well, it, it is great. And it's something that we're going to be including into it to our technology. Yeah, I think people, you know, I think agents need to familiarize themselves with their suppliers health and safety policies and, and make sure they communicate those clearly and stress how important it is to 
to suppliers as well. Um, I also think one of the important things is going to be offering healthy destinations, such as outdoors destinations. You know, we, we see in the US at the moment, a lot of people are taking uh, road trips to remote areas where there aren't people around. Uh, we saw it a lot in the UK in the summer as well. People, there were, a lot more people were doing sort of outdoorsy type holidays, um, trying to avoid crowds, going to areas with few visitors. Um, private accommodation rentals and private transportation are growing as well. I think people don't want to stay in in hotels where they're going to be crammed into the lobby with several hundred people. Um, I think vacation rentals, villas, private apartments, um, private transportation, even private jets for luxury companies uh, is growing as well. Uh, and as Anthony mentioned, use technology that enables you to sell a wide range of destinations and suppliers and, and through which they can communicate what their health and safety policies are. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, I go back to like, this is a new problem and trying to work out yeah. how to, like, there's lots of data out there. We can use data to make decisions and, 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 and make, um, so the probability is on our side that we're making the, the, the right decisions with the amount of data. So, but it's working out which lots of data that, 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 that you, you use. We're working with uh, a, a data collection agency in, in Europe, and they're collecting data from the World Health Organization. They're dealing with multiple governments around the world, getting data from, from them and on where their hotspots are and where it's safe and where it's, where it's not safe. It's also bringing in data from all of the hotel providers um, and different cleanliness level um, in, in, in the hotels and what their what protocol that, that they've engaged and then using general data on what consumers think of um, the cleanliness of, of, of the, these products to try and come back with a with, with, with a rating that uses as much data as possible is out there to to, to recommend the, um, different hotels that you, you that you should be able to stay at with, um, with, with comfort that you, you've done all of the checks possible that, that, that you can. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think that is something that consumers are concerned about and da having data reporting like this is very important. Exactly. Um, related to what we mentioned before is uh, about quiet destinations is sustainability. Um, this is a picture of, you probably recognise this if, you, if you've travelled in Asia, this is Angkor Wat, Cambodia, before the pandemic. This is just after the sunrise, this is tourists there getting pictures of the sunrise over, uh, over Angkor Wat. Um, not a particularly pleasant experience if, if you're like me and you want to photograph these places without tourists there. I can't um, believe how clear it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Here's a recent news story. Cambodians revel in now tourist-free Angkor Wat. There are no tourists there. There are no buses pulling up every morning and Cambodians are starting to reclaim it and visit it themselves because they've, they've, got, they've got it to themselves now. So there's never been a better time to visit a lot of these destinations. And people are actually thinking, well, do we want to go back to the old way? Do we want to go back to, to thousands of tourists pouring into this, this destination uh, every day? Here's a new story from India earlier this year. Uh, people in India can see the Himalayas for the first time in decades as the lockdown eases air pollution. And it's been the same here in, in Bangkok as well. The air pollution levels have been lower than, than any time I can remember since I came to live here uh, eight years ago. We've not had tourists here. We had a lockdown for a while when people weren't driving their cars around. More people are working from home, so there's less traffic on the roads. Um, so we've, it's given us an insight into the damage that mass tourism does uh, to the environment. And, and to destinations. And we're starting to question, do we, do we want to go back to the old way? Um, well, I, I think if I was a DMC or a tour operator, I'd be saying, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. And I think we probably will go back to the old way, sadly. But, but, I, think but it, I think it's given people a new insight into, into sustainable travel, though. Don't you but, really agree? But, but I think it's a great opportunity to, to get people back to these places by saying, get back there before the crowds get back there. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, experience this without the crowds. I think, you know, that's going to be a great way to kickstart um, the industry in a lot of these areas. 
And I think I think there's you know, the greater awareness of sustainable travel means that agents, I think, have to work with sustainable destinations and suppliers, but also focusing on secondary destinations rather than the usual tourist hotspot uh, as well, I think, will become an increasing uh, an increasing focus. There's a lot. I did a webinar recently for the US market on secondary destinations in Asia, and there's a lot of interest in it because um, if you want repeat tourists, you've got to stress the secondary destinations. When people come to Thailand for the first time, they all do Bangkok, they all do Chiang Mai, they do Pattaya, they do the same places. If you want to get them back, you've got to promote these secondary destinations. Uh, and I think companies introducing their own sustainability codes, we, we, we see a lot of companies doing that, also promoting ethical travel and voluntourism as well, I think are gonna, gonna become uh, more widespread. Um, we're seeing, we'll just cover this one fairly briefly. We're seeing an increase in, in interest in group and family travel. This is a survey, I think this was a survey by Google. I can't remember where I got this one from. Um, people were asked what trip they'll do as soon as they can travel again. And the, the majority, 40% was yes, a family or group trip. People haven't seen their families and friends for a while and they, they want to travel with them. They want to go and see them and get together with them. Um, I assume the 27% who want a solo trip are people who've been locked in with their families for the last year and are just desperate to get away, and spend some time on their own, maybe. Um, obviously, how to, to capitalize on that? Well, target group and family bookers. It's usually the mother or the wife of the family who books these trips. Um, think about working with family-friendly suppliers, push family and group-friendly activities. Again, private villa, private home rentals. I think are going to be a big thing as well. People don't want to put their family maybe in a, in a busy, crowded hotel. Um, and now is a really good time to book villa and private home rentals. It's, it's good value. And, and use a tech solution that makes it easy to build group itineraries and share group itineraries with the participants as well. But that's an important thing, wouldn't you say, Anthony? Yeah, I know a good company that does that. Really? Who, who might that be? <laughs> Talk about that very shortly. Um, again, another one we'll, we'll cover fairly quickly is longer booking times. We think that um, people won't be doing so much last minute booking because people have got to spend more time planning their insurance and doing their research, as we saw before on, on hotel and airline health and safety policies. We think people are going to be booking ahead a lot more. 84% of respondents um, to this uh, Amadeus survey said they were going to be uh, booking ahead. Only 4% are going to be booking last minute. And here's how that breaks down sort of geographically and demographically. Americans generally three to six months in advance, baby boomers, older travelers over six months in advance, Generation Z one to three months in advance. Middle East and Africa is still more last minute, but I think the rest of the world you're going to be looking at probably three, mo three months or more is going, to be, uh, is going to be more common, I think. Um, so companies should really be, be looking at early bird discounts get people to, to book early. Um, obviously to do that, you need to have your, your refund and your cancellation policies clear and, uh, and up to date as well, because people are gonna book a long time in advance. They wanna know they can get refunds or make changes if, if circumstances change. I think, and, I think that's gonna be the, 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 the bigger point, um, giving people the, the, the comfort or the ability to dream now, dream about that, that that trip to Africa or the the trip to Latin America now, um, and have be able to give them the confidence to be able to book that now, knowing that they're going to get a refund. I think that that's the the, the biggest thing um, to to start getting bookings at the moment. And, and I think companies should really be looking at you know starting to promote late twenty twenty one. By which time we should things being well being able to travel internationally again. Um, use of travel agents. We, we can see the use of travel agents is going to increase. Um, this is another Amadeus survey. Nearly half of global travelers believe that some level of travel agent assistance is required for their uh, international trips. It goes down a little bit for domestic travel. 42% um, say they're going to need travel agent assistance and a quarter more, 26%, so they might require some travel agents for their international trips. Um, again, this relates to what we mentioned before about learning more about hotel and airline safety policies. It's a lot of work to do all that research yourself. And as Anthony said, travel agents can really capitalize on that and, and help people with their, with their planning and research. Um, 
and also people uh, are expecting more recommendations for their travel than before COVID-19. 33% say that they should be getting more recommendations from their travel agent than they would previously. Um, so people are, are actually actively looking for advice and looking for help from travel agents who, who maybe wouldn't have been before. So there's a big opportunity for travel agents there. Yeah, that's still 66% of the market at the same or um, want greater level of advice from agents. And that's exactly that and 27 that's and 27% are not sure. So some of those are, are convertible as well. Mm -hmm. How can agents capitalize on this? I think one of the things is, is to capitalize on the negative press that we saw for, for OTAs during the pandemic and the, and the negative press we saw for airlines and hotels. Um, Stressing the advantages of booking with a travel agent in terms of having that personalized itinerary, having that high level of service, uh, easier to make changes, having that support when you're in the destination as well. Because when you when you book with an online travel, uh, an OTA, you don't really get that support when you're actually in the destination, whereas with a travel agent, you, you most definitely do get that. Um, and I think promoting unique itineraries and destinations to show your expertise instead of just selling the usual destinations, the usual tourist hotspots going a little bit deeper and, and using technology that allows you to easily build itineraries for global destinations and providing customers with mobile app support when they travel as well is you know, generally technology is going to be increasingly important. And Finally, on, on that subject, uh, we come to the, the topic of digital transformation. Um, I, I use this cartoon in pretty much every webinar I do at the moment on this subject. It pretty much illustrates what happened. A lot of companies were quite complacent about adopting technology and digitally transforming themselves, but COVID-19 has come along and has kind of smashed through that. Um, and it's really, really made it imperative that companies adopt technology. Um, Here's uh, some research from a recent SCIFT survey. This is a survey of, of travel companies worldwide. How important is it for your travel organization to proceed with its pre-existing digital transformation activities in light of COVID-19? 43% say much more important and 35% say somewhat more important. So that's basically 78% uh, believe that COVID-19 has made it more important to uh, proceed with their digital transformation. Is good news for tech companies, Anthony, of course. Well, it's, it, it's been needed for a long time, uh, but it hasn't been forced um, up, upon the industry. But like I think now with um, the consumer becoming more tech savvy during, during COVID, uh, this has now become a much more important thing for the tour companies and hoteliers uh, and, and travel agents. Uh, yeah, that's a good point because I think that in this year there's been a lot of people who may not have used technology before have suddenly become a lot more tech savvy. They're using Zoom to chat to their their family. They're using apps to order food and uh, online shopping. They're using test and trace apps. So maybe a lot of people who hadn't adopted technology who have and they expect to be able to book travel in in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how can companies? Uh, capitalize on this uh, obviously thinking about online quoting booking the old dmc model where people send through a quote request and get a response a couple of days later is, is dying out people want instant service and instant gratification now um i think travel companies need to invest more in, in digital marketing that's things like crm segmentation social media we did a webinar on that uh, recently um, the good thing is the barrier to entry is lower than ever uh, cloud technology means that it's a lot easier to adopt technology. You don't need to install servers or implement software in your own company. Uh, generally, it's it's uh, it's pretty much buy and buy and go now. Um, the technology is easier to use than it's ever been. There's no need to mess around with, with codes like you like you used to use when you were using travel agent technology. Um, and really, companies need to look at solutions that are low cost that are easy to implement and use that have global coverage and also come with mobile. Uh, with a mobile solution as well. Mobile is becoming, becoming increasingly important. Would, would you agree with that, Anthony? Uh, yes, you, you need mobile. Um, everyone is reliant on it. Um, for distribution of vouchers, everyone wants to, wants to go paperless. Um, yeah. So, so that, that's become really in, in, important. Um, and, you know, people feel naked without their phone with them these days. <laughs> Because that is their travel agent in a pocket. Um, 
And yeah, they, they, they always want to have that, that safety. So I think it's very important. I with my recent trip to Kanchanaburi, I stayed in a, an eco lodge, like a floating jungle lodge on the, on the river. And there was no electricity, there was no mob, mobile phone access, there was no internet. So I was without my phone for two days. And it felt, it was actually quite nice. My, I, my eye strain recovered, my neck strain recovered. No, I was, I've, I was, I've, I've, I've actually been up there, it's very beautiful. Really. I, I was totally relaxed after, after two days. I'm actually going up to a Tuka this weekend and I think the phone might fall in the water. Yeah, <laughs> it does you good now and again just to have a day, a day or two off, physically and mentally. Um, we're going to show you a quick video now because obviously this is uh, this is an eRoam webinar, so we're going to we're going to talk about eRoam just for five minutes. So this is a quick two minute video just to give you a very basic overview of how uh, travel agents can can use eRoam. So uh, just give us a couple of seconds to uh, to load. My computer always runs slow when I'm screen sharing, so it'll take a couple of seconds. Meet Jack and Jill. They have an appointment to visit their travel advisor today. They plan to book their round the world dream holiday. Jack explains his priorities are snorkeling and diving in Africa, Australia, and Thailand. Jill's priorities are visiting the hill tribes, shopping on Rodeo Drive, and taking the train across the Rocky Mountains. The advisor prepares and shows the proposed itinerary to Jack and Jill, which they agree to buy and get handed their tickets. Now Jack and Jill are ready to go on their holiday. They can go to the airport and all the work is done, right? Wrong. Let's take a look behind the scenes at what really happens and all the travel professionals involved in making a booking like this. First, the travel advisor conducts a consultation with the clients on where they want to travel and their requirements. From this information, the advisor checks availability and creates an itinerary with flights, hotels, and activities. This can take hours as they review from the millions of hotels, motels, guest houses, and hostels that are showing in the marketplace, and then working out what is best suited to Jack and Jill. With eRoam, the travel advisor can find, in minutes, curated content displaying the best hotels for your clients. Next, the advisor looks at the availability of over a thousand airline, train, and bus operators to see which offer the best deal based on Jack and Jill's requirements. Finally, the advisor needs to add from the curated content the best tour operators, DMCs, and wholesalers, like snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef, cruising down the Mekong River to Luang Prabang, or a first-class suite on the famous Rocky Mountaineer train. This can take suppliers several hours and, in most cases, days to respond to the advisor. With eRoam, this can be done in minutes. Once the advisor has all this information, they can then create a quote and proposed itinerary. This step normally takes a further two or more hours, but eRoam does this instantly. The eRoam Travel Operations Project is a partnership of eRoam Technologies and Travel Operations powered by Microsoft Dynamics. If you would like to learn more, please contact our team. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just before we finish, uh, a quick rundown of our, uh, our main features. Um, we have millions of products in over 100,000 destinations. We have over a million hotels, tours and activities, car rental, cruising, ferries, uh, transfers, flights, international and domestic flights. Have I missed anything, Anthony? Anything else I've missed out? No, I think you got most of it. Um, we're, adding we're adding insurance soon, I think, as well, aren't we? Well, yeah, look, the, the important thing what eRoam does and what we I will um, ask you to do, Tim, is to send out, I've, got, I've done a new um, video um, that shows actually our, our latest um, eRoam platform. With, and, and what the eRoam platform does, it, it cr creates any itinerary, whether it's a point-to-point -point itinerary. So you could be going from Singapore to Phuket for, for a weekend and back again or you could be going from Bangkok and traveling all around, around Europe. With, with the ARAM technology, you can create those itineraries in seconds. Um, we've got all of the transfer companies. We've got over 900 airlines, over, over a thousand coach companies. We've got, in, in most towns and cities, we've got between 50 and 200 tour operators and DMCs in each of the cities globally. So that's whether or not you're in Latin America, Europe, Africa, Australia, or, or, or New Zealand. It's, it, it's a source of um, 
it's an unbiased resource of, of content globally. The agents can still do all of the bookings uh, directly with, with the suppliers that they've got relationships with. We just try and make that a lot easier and we charge $2 a day um, for that technology. That's my little yeah. spiel. And, I, and as Anthony said, we have fast quoting, fast booking, fast changes. So it's very easy to change bookings. Um, In, itineraries. And itineraries, interesting. Yeah. All of the paperwork is done, um, is automated. We have API integrations with, uh, I think we're in the hundreds now, aren't we, of travel providers in terms of the number of API integrations? We've got all of the major hotel aggregators or, or you know, a, lo a lot of the world's leading tour operators. Um, as I said, all of the airlines, um, uh, coach and bus companies. Um, we're, we're integrating ferry and rail companies globally. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, a single source to create seamless bookings anywhere in, in the world use, with the agents using their own contracts. Yeah. And we can provide a white label front end uh, client login as well, both B2B and uh, B2C to integrate right. with, with agent websites. And we'll shortly be launching Journey, which is our mobile app as well. So uh, eRoam will come with a, a mobile app that Correct. travel agents Correct. can and give to their, their travelers. And yeah. you can find more on our website, which will give you information about in a second. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please let us know. I haven't seen any questions come through on the Q&A thing, but if anyone's got any questions, now is the time to type them in. Anthony, you, you, uh, if you had any questions? Uh, look, I, I think we've actually gone a little bit over. Um, we have gone a little time. bit over time, actually. Yeah. So we'll, um, if no one has any questions, we'll, um, we'll probably round it off there. So we'll, we'll, if we can, if we can send out um, a, a, a video and yeah, we'll uh, we'll be following us. we'll be following this up uh, after the event. I'll 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 email everybody who's who's joined and registered. Um, you can find out more on our website, which we recently revamped at eRoam.com, and you can email Anthony or myself, Anthony eRoam.com or Tim Russell eRoam.com. You can follow us on on LinkedIn as well, where we're quite active. And keep a lookout for more webinar. Oh, I think we've had a question come through here, actually. Oh, I don't have questions, only thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> um, that's an easy one to answer. Uh, keep a lookout for future webinars. We'll, we'll, we do webinars. We do at least one webinar every month. So keep a, a lookout for that. And thank you for joining. And uh, we look forward to talking with you and hopefully working with you soon. Thanks, Anthony, for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, and thank you everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. All right, goodbye. Okay. Have a good day. Bye-bye.